So normally here on a Tuesday, we do telephone Tuesdays, but I make the rules. So I'm saying today we are going to do telegraph Tuesdays. And I think it's actually going to be part of like maybe a three part series talking about all the history of telegraphy. And it's a good time to do it, we thought, because we've got a load of projects ongoing and coming up that are going to tie in with telegraph history. Don't tell anybody, but I actually find the telegraph stuff even more interesting than the telephone stuff. So what is the difference between telephony and telegraphy? Well, it's in the name, isn't it? So uh, these all come from the Greek uh, tele, which means at a distance. Uh, phone is sound and graph is writing. So with a telegraph machine, you are writing at a distance. Telegraphs predate telephones by quite a way. I mean, it's anachronistic, but we could even look back all the way to the earliest coded signals that were sent over distance, like smoke signals or uh, drums even. More sophisticated pre-electric methods include things like flag semaphore, uh, which was used by the Navy, of course, not very useful uh, if you have hills in the way though. There were a load of towers in the 1790s set up across France by a fella called Claude Chappé. I think that's how you say it. They used uh, arms that moved a bit like uh, David Brent to signal words and phrases. And it's about that time that the word telegraph came into use. There's a great story about two brothers who bribed the Chappé operators to send messages to them about the Paris Stock Exchange before anyone else so they could make loads of money. And they did, and they got away with it as well. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it's a race that's still happening to this day with companies spending millions on microwave links and uh, fibre optics next to the stock exchanges. That system from the Napoleonic days actually worked so well that uh, the French were pretty slow to take up electric telegraphs when they eventually came around. They did uh, make a kind of halfway measure where they made a kind of electronic version of it with the same uh, arms on it, but uh, it didn't work too well and eventually was replaced by Morse. Okay, so let's go back in time and talk about the development of the electric telegraph. This is where it starts to get really interesting. The 17 and early 1800s were absolutely fascinating time for science. We had clever folks like Ampere, Galvani and Michael Faraday uh, all discovering and observing uh, new things about electricity like electrostatic attraction, chemical reactions and most importantly uh, electromagnetism. So this is how you can use current down a wire to make a magnetic field and move things. Yeah, People must have thought it was some kind of magic, telekinesis if you will. And it wasn't very long until some clever folks figured out how to use all of these things to make telegraphs. One idea that was proposed in 1753 was to deflect little pith balls with electrostatic force. That's the kind of stuff that you all know from playing with those Van de Graaff generators in school that make your hair stand up. And that idea was first realised in real life by Georges-Louis Losange in uh, 1774. It had 26 wires going between the sender and the receiver, one for each letter of the alphabet, and it only went between two rooms of his house. Uh, so we're already coming up against some problems that need to be solved. The simplicity of the machinery and long distance transmission. All this is happening before the invention of the battery, of course, which is uh, quite mind-blowing. In 1800, Alessandro Volta, who we get the measuring unit volts from, uh, came up with his uh, voltaic pile, and that was the first time that you could have continuous current, which is pretty useful. Uh, Francis Ronald managed to make a better electrostatic telegraph in 1816 that could send messages between two rotating dials. It was about eight miles apart, so it's not bad, is it? He did offer the uh, design to the Navy, who came back and told him that it was wholly unnecessary. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. Um, but he did go on then to uh, write the first ever published book on telegraphy, so I think we can remember him as a pioneer. Stepping back a little bit to 1804, there's a fellow called Francisco Salva Campillo and uh, Samuel Thomas von Sommering, and uh, they actually made some electrochemical telegraphs. Both of their designs had multiple wires representing the letters and numbers, and at the receiving end, those wires were dipped into jars of acid. And when you apply a current to the wire, little hydrogen bubbles bubble up as the acid is electrocyzed and the operator would watch which bubbles are bubbling and write down the letter. Works pretty good. 
This wasn't actually Francisco's first go at uh, making a telegraph. In his previous design, he didn't use the jars of acid. He just had a load of people holding the ends of the wires. And when they got shocked, they just shouted out the number or letter that they'd been assigned and he noted it down on a piece of paper. Uh, yeah, I mean, it worked. <laughs> So now we reach a pretty amazing period of time where loads of things are getting discovered and invented. So buckle up. Hans Christian Ørsted uh, discovers in 1920 that a current through a wire will create magnetic field and deflect a compass needle. And in the same year, Johann Schweiger puts it to practical use in his galvanometer. Uh, coil a wire around a compass that could be used as a sensitive indicator for electric current. And a calibrated version of it developed into the ammeter. And out of that came the idea of needle telegraphs. An early example being the Schilling telegraph invented by Baron Schilling von Kanstadt in 1830. Two, uh, he clearly didn't pay his uh, portrait artist enough. Look at those eyes. Uh, and his telegraph had uh, six galvanometers on the receiving end with magnetic needles suspended by silk threads. Schilling's telegraph had a keyboard transmitter with 16 black and white keys. So we're getting closer to one of these things. Schilling was also one of the first people to put into practice the idea of representing letters with binary numbers. Now, you've got to stick with me on this. This is going to be pretty cool, uh, but it is going to be a little bit like a math lesson. This is a museum. What do you want? Uh, so you're going to come out at the end of this a bit cleverer than you came in. You've just got to stick with me, okay? Attention spans, attention spans. So in a decimal system, right, which you all know because we've got 10 fingers, there are 10 different symbols in the number system, yeah? One to nine and also naught, okay? Uh, but in a binary digit system, there are only two symbols, okay? So they could be labeled different things, on or off, one or zero, dot and dash, yeah? We'll get to that later. So each binary digit, a bit, yeah? Uh, although they wouldn't have called them bits at the time, uh, is weighted according to its position in the number, yeah? And that sounds complicated, but you already know this because you know how to work a decimal system, okay? So in a decimal number, if I was to write down uh, 1,111, you know that this column is the ones, you've got the tens, you've got the hundreds, and you've got the thousands. So you're using the same symbol, but they're all weighted different, yeah? And this is the least significantly uh, weighted. And this one, if you change this, is gonna make the most significant change to the number. Let me show you what I mean. Instead of being ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, binary is weighted exponentially. So that means that when this position is on, when it's a one rather than a zero, this is worth one, okay? Well, this position then is worth two, and then it doubles again, so this one's worth four when it's on, this one's worth eight. So if I was counting up to seven on my hands, I'd have to use seven fingers, right? Well, in a binary system, I could just use three. Obviously, this binary code doesn't have to represent numbers. It could represent letters of the alphabet, for example. So the clever bit that you've got to figure out is the encoding and the decoding. The downside is that the operator has to learn the code if the machine doesn't translate it for them. So a lot of development has happened already, but a big sea change came in 1825 when William Sturgeon invented the electromagnet. This is different to a galvanometer. You've got coils of wire wrapped around a soft iron core. And when you put current through the coil, it makes the core magnetic. Joseph Henry made a more powerful version in 1828 and demonstrated his idea of an electric telegraph by uh, ringing a bell through a mile of cable around a lecture theater. He also made a printing telegraph later. And using that in 1835, Edward Davy and Joseph Henry made the mercury dipping relay. Uh, so this was an electrical switch and you used an electromagnet to pull a needle into a pool of mercury. In 1837, Davy invented the slightly more practical uh, metallic relay that had an armature just like these ones, no pool of mercury. And that was a big deal because the relay was the first time you could ever amplify signals. And you needed that for telegraphs because signals fade over distance. Uh, you can send a small current into the coil, which moves the switch and turns on a big current amplification. 
So this is a GPO Type B relay made in the 1920s, so a bit later, but loads of these used to be spaced along the telegraph line to regenerate the signals. Like a tired runner uh, handing over a baton to a guy with loads of energy in a relay race. That's why they're called relays. Often telegraph lines ran along railway lines. It made sense because they're relatively straight and they run between big cities and the railway companies use the telegraphs for their signals. Okay, so the transmission method of electromagnetism has appeared. We can send signals across long distances. We can encode it in binary to simplify the signals. And we've got the first keyboard interfaces starting to appear. Things are getting really exciting. So we've spanned about 150 years worth of development so far. And next time we're gonna pick up in the same year that the relay was invented, 1837, and talk about the first widespread commercial telegraph systems that started to appear. Join me then. I did have to leave a load of things out, sorry Gauss and Weber, but uh, feel free to fill in the gaps in the comments. I'm sure people will be very interested in all the stories that you have. Um, it takes a lot of effort actually to make a video like this, so please do uh, visit the Patreon link so that we can continue doing stuff like this. And also, uh, big announcement, we are gonna be opening on Wednesdays during the summer holidays. So check the website for the opening hours and come and see us. Come and play with all of this cool stuff. So I will see you at next Telegraph Tuesday.